most hilarious video tribute I've ever seen. <laughs> Spooky Empire. Woo! I think you had as much fun as I did. Yes! Yes! This was a good weekend, wasn't it? It was a great weekend. Thank you all for like being here and uh, you know stopping by my table, everybody's table, and just enjoying yourselves. <laughs> it's a wonderful time. Well, thank you so much for being here. You're an absolute legend, and uh, I, I wanted to ask you about the character of, of Candyman, and what I think is so unique about the character is his backstory. So when you were actually um, filming, what kind of uh, mental attitude did you have to have in order to play a character with, with such a, a crazy backstory? Um, well, the backstory was my idea. It was was it? Yeah, I went to Bernard and I said, we have to have a reason for this, you know, displaced romantic character to exist in the modern world. So I just wanted to make sure that it was rooted and we had a cause for why he became, you know, Candyman, why right? Daniel became Candyman. And Bernard agreed with me and we ran with that. Um, you know, I, I'm a method actor, so we had a, a sublime way of preparation. Virginia Madison and I, we actually did horseback riding together, fencing, um, ballroom dancing, just to get into the, you know, the turn of the century romantic uh, methods. Yeah, I had no idea. I didn't know that you came up with your own backstory. Have you have to. You know, I have. A, I got my master's in theater, so seven years of that, and they teach us how to dissect the character and uh, complete the arc and try to make it, you know, acceptable and palpable to you guys. So, out of curiosity, when it does come to method acting, at what point do you switch from Candyman to Tony Todd? Like when you go home at night. So, so, like, when you go home, I'm not going to be home. Obviously, I'm not going home and bringing the beast with you, but. I'm over, but I'm not. You know, I got the bees at home. I can't wait to get hold of my cats. I just moved uh, to Marina Del Rey. Got two cats waiting for me. They've been there for four days now. I know they're going to be angry and tight. They need their temptations. And,
nice. <laughs> Love it. And, uh, you know, it was a tough upbringing, but I didn't even realize we were poor until I was around 13, because my aunt was, she was like a pillar of strength. She was a domestic, she worked cleaning houses. And I, when I was young, I used to go with her, and I was always gravitating to the libraries, because I just loved to read and soak up the classic arts. And she always made sure I had a, a not only a plate on my table every night, but every summer she put me into a different program, from geology to boy scouting, uh, just all kinds of, to keep my mind active, you know? And then, you know, when I was in uh, high school, I discovered acting. As you said, I wanted you to be a lawyer, but if you can make a living being an actor, go for it. That's awesome. Do you have a, a title for your book yet? Um, no, this, I, I'm not sure. I want it to be humble, and I want it to be an inspiration to anybody that feels that they don't have a chance to find their place in life, that if it can happen to me, and if you train and prepare for whatever your choice of life is, you can make it. Never say never. You know, you gotta just be ready when the opportunity presents itself. I love that. And I just just wanted to be an inspiration to people because it's been a, it's been an incredible journey. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay, so I see you already have somebody that, that wants to ask you a question. If that's what you can we'll take some questions to the audience. Let's go! <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna ask you if, uh, is it, I hope that we're gonna find out the uh, final destination, for the final destination. And what about if they go put you in it? A final destination? If they're making a new one? Yes. Oh, okay. uh, they've been working on the script for the final destination for about a year now. And uh, Jeffrey uh, Reddick, who created it, yeah. hasn't been happy. I, I did make him. You did? Yeah. He's a great guy. He's a yeah. great guy. You know, Final Destination was originally a, uh, a script suggestion for X Files. And. <laughs> Yeah, it was going to be a one and done thing, but they said somebody had the foresight to say, no, let's hold that, let's develop it. And, you know, we had five movies. But as soon as they finish uh, getting the script prepared, then we're going to start shooting sometime next year. Uh -huh. yeah. FD. I saw the original at a drive-in theater when I was like a freshman in high school. And I said, and I knew kind of that I wanted to get into public speaking or motivational work, and then acting was a third choice. And uh, you know, when I saw Dwayne being heroic and not being Sidney Poitier, not saving nuns, but you know, rescuing real people in a zombie situation, I said, I want to do that. And uh, it was weird because I was working with Forrest Whitaker who went, been in platoon with. We're in Pittsburgh shooting a movie. And he said, Tony, you know, they're doing Night Living Dead. How come you're not, come you're not ready for that? And he said, you, you look just like Dwayne. Go for it. So that Saturday, I ran into the production office. I ran into Tom Savini. He said, no, man, I think we're done. I grabbed him by his lapels, <laughs> sat him down, and told my story of what it would be like in a new zombie apocalypse. Next thing you know, Monday, I was done. Sometimes you gotta have a little chutzpah in life. If you want what you want and you want it positively, you can achieve it. Just, you know, chutzpah. crawl through the cobwebs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Zanini is a genius. I love him. Hey, Tony. Uh, so I heard that you negotiated a deal during Candyman that every time you got stung by a beat, you got a thousand dollars. Was that true? And what was the matter? That is true. I had a great lawyer. Uh, Craig <laughs> I kind of knew that there might be a sting or two involved in this thing. Because, you know, we, at those days we had, it was, it was no CGI, it was practicals, real effects, which is why, part of the reason why the film is so magical. We got Philip Brook Glass's uh, soundtrack, you got the lovely effervescent Virginia Madison as the leading lady. Uh, you got Tony Richmond with the brilliant cinematography, the city of Chicago, and just this mythic love story at its core. So yes, uh, so 26 things all together. Oh, 
There was a million bees on the set. Norman Derry, who was our bee regular, he wanted, this man loved what he did. This is a, whatever you do, you gotta love your job, love your passion. And he said, Tony, I want you to go into the trail, I want you to read the bees. I said, is it necessary, Norman? He said, no, I think you, you need to get used to them. And he went in there and he knew the bees by name. Whether he was bullshit me or not, I'm not quite sure. There's a little Gary, there's Jerry, there's Squirrely, there's Mo, you know, get to use some. And, uh, you know, <laughs> and, you know, everybody on the set was just in, in love with their particular uh, task on the set. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can we expect more bees? Do you guys have fun this weekend? Yeah! I mean, I'm still really, well, I don't even know what I did last night. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Part of the panel. <laughs> Good, don't judge me. <laughs> Hi, Tony, how you doing? What's up, man? Um, so, uh, that was actually a revelation of saying you made up the backstory for Candyman, so I have a question about that. Um, in creating that backstory, did you draw on any specific um, historical incidents or legends or anything like that when you were coming up with that? Yes. I, I drew upon all the lynchings that had happened in America's history, you know? Uh, and I started from there and I wanted to, you know, at the turn of the century, we still had racial strife and, you know, African Americans were not treated in an equal situation. And I wanted, you know, Daniel Robitaille came from, a, his father was a successful shoe cobbler. And Daniel wanted to be an artist. And I wanted, I started with that. I started doing sketch work and stuff. And then, you know, one day he fell in love with the woman that wasn't, his race, and because of that, they cut off the thing that he loved the most, his art. And so, it just kills his, his requited passion. Yeah, uh, it's a beautiful backstory. Like, it's, it seems like it's so naturally woven in there, so I just wanted to say, like, it's amazing. Good job. And, and going back to Jordan Peele's reinterpretation, it's a spiritual reawakening. Yeah. And uh, I wish I could give you the secrets away, but they would kill me. <laughs> Let's just say that my interpretation is a grandfathering in of all the possibilities of how many candy mans there may exist in the world. Oh. That's okay. And I signed a contract for three pictures, so there may be three of them. What? You know, Including Sammy Davis Jr.'s interpretation. Yes, sir. And, uh, you can take the sunrise, <laughs> sprinkle it with two. The candy man. So, being that you came up with the backstory, did you also have a uh, hand in the narrative for the overall movie, or was that something that was presented to you that drew you in um, to play Candyman? Well, how many people know who directed Candyman, first of all? Okay, what's his name? Bernard Rose. Bernard Rose. One of my best friends in life. Uh, he had the brilliant uh, inspiration to take a story that was set in Liverpool and transpose it to modern America via Chicago. And uh, that was just brilliant. And, uh, to this day, Bernard and I are very good friends. We're actually going to work on a script called Fingers next year. Oh. Yeah. It's, it's about a man on death row that can't be killed. And he goes and revisits all of the people that put him in that particular situation. Oh. I play that guy. And uh, my character says one word in the movie, and it's fingers. <laughs> That's it. And everything else is a voyeuristic experience and redemption. Um, yeah, so I'm proud of Bernard. He's a great man. He just did a movie called Samurai, and he shot in Japan. So, good man. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And Clive, of course, you know, the original inspiration. Hi, Tony. What's up? Um, you mentioned uh, Jordan Peele being involved in the new uh, Candyman movie. Very He's becoming one of my favorite new uh, directors. And um, 
Uh, my question has in part to, to uh, his earlier, one of his earlier films, uh, Us, and uh, just wanted to ask you if you ever faced an evil clone of yourself, uh, <laughs> what would you do in that situation? I actually met him last night. <laughs> There I was saying, maybe you should go to bed and be in bed by 12. And my little clone said, no. Everybody's in the lobby, why should you go to bed? It's a dark, dangerous place. Well, did the clone remind you of daylight savings time? So you got that extra hour? That's right, all, you know, day and hour. I didn't know what time that happened. All of a sudden, it was two again. And... It was all 20 pounds clone. shoot a movie, uh, Bulletproof 2, which isn't out yet. I got 10 films in a can, guys, so there's a lot of stuff. If you follow me on Twitter, at TonyTodd54, I'll tell you when it drops. I just had one open November 1st called Badlands, which is a Western. Anyway, I was, and I knew he was getting ill, and Cat Daddy, for the last 18 years, is my first script reading partner. Every script I got, he would be always like sat on my shoulder, or, the edge of the couch, and I just read the words so And if he jumped off the edge of the couch, I knew it wasn't worth doing. He could <laughs> say it. He gave his little temptations and his little fancy things. I knew it was a winner. Oh. Um, and, uh, you know, I went away, and he waited for me to go away in the past. Oh. It broke my heart. And Bulletproof 2 was a comedy. And I found out the day before I had to shoot that I had to be funny. And, you know, the love of my spiritual animal life had passed. The two I have now uh, is a little girl named Charlie Parker who uh -huh. hates humans, including me. <laughs> Sometimes I'll see her after midnight walk out when she thinks I'm asleep and she rolls around and she looks at me and she swings and goes away. You know, but I love her. I mean, she just got a personality disorder. The other, the older cat is Sparky Sparks. He's <laughs> fat, eats everything and, and like it. You know, uh, sits by my side all the time. Oh. Cats are wonderful. Yes. Yes. They're, they're, like, they're spirit animals, you know? Yes. So, thank you for that. Yeah, I, I like dogs too, but I don't have the patience for a dog. <laughs> I, I have a sugar lighter and a hedgehog, so I think I might need to get a cat now. I think you convinced me. I think I will. I always wanted a spider monkey too. I'm a, I was a fan of Richard Pryor, you know, and that routine he does, and the deuces come over to his house, and, and they climb up in the air, and they try to fuck his air load. <laughs> so that made me feel manic. If we were doing this panel, and then all of a sudden, like, hey, we have special guests, and then your monkey comes out, and like, instead of being so cute. Monkeys, monkeys, bats, lizards, big turtles. Life, it's all the celebration. Hi, John. What's up? Uh, I'd love to ask you about your work on Star Trek. Uh, specifically, you mentioned earlier about being a method actor. So in order to play uh, your role on Star Trek, did you hang out with other Klingon actors, Robert O'Reilly, Michael Dorney, those guys, to immerse yourself into that? And how does that compare to your voiceover work? Uh, well, uh, you know, Star Trek was a major part of my career. I auditioned for them six times before I got the role of Kern, Wars Brother. So I knew they wanted to do business, and they actually gave me the best role of the six. Uh, now, Klingons are easy, you know? They just, they hate everybody. <laughs> they particularly hate humans. And, and, and Kern's trajectory is he wanted his brother to become a Klingon again and stop trying to be a human, because humans stink. <laughs> Enough. Thank you. Just go with one thing, and you seize it, and you grip it, and you just play it completely. But I love Kern. They were kind to me. I've actually played four different characters in Star Trek. My favorite is the Visitor in uh, Deep Space Nine. You know? That's great. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hello, Lee. It's an honor. Um, I just wanted to ask, from an actor's standpoint, what do you find the most interesting when working with Bernard Rhodes that you also develop other works with him? But in 
anything on, uh, particularly, what do you find the most interesting, you being a method actor? And by the way, thank you for all these uh, very enriching commentaries in the if anyone has the Blu-ray or uh, DVD special edition, your interviews and your audio commentary where you provide this insight into the acting and mythology is beautiful. So my question is, um, what do you find the most interesting? Um, nothing. <laughs> He loves blues, I love blues, I'm a huge music fan. We were hanging out at a blues bar, and he says, Tony, this role is going to change your life. I said, Bernard, I don't know about that. I'm going to play it as good as I know how to do it, and we'll just leave it to that. 27 years later, even, even conventions now withstanding, I can be at a grocery store, buying toilet paper like everybody needs. Right? <laughs> People follow me around and try to talk to me. They said, hey, can you make me? You know, I've heard it for 27 years, and I appreciate it. But it's not the only thing. You know, I love him to death. He's one of my children. And, uh, and I thought I would get away from it. And here comes Jordan Peele saying, we're going to disappoint him. <laughs> my daughter, I have two beautiful children, Alex and Ariana. And one time, uh, she was about three and a half. And it was Christmas. You know, when Candyman first came out, it, it wasn't, it was a gradual, slow build towards its acceptance. And uh, people were following us around in the mall. Hey, 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 Candyman, Candyman. And she dropped her little bag and said, that's not Candyman, that's my dad. <laughs> and it resonated so deeply with me because it made me, A, not believe the hype, no matter what. Stay true to yourself, stay humble. Remember your poverty, and uh, you know, and the cares reward you, no matter what. I love Candyman now. I, I, it was a point when I hated him. One thing, one of my pet peeves, people used to come up to me and say, you scared me when I was a kid, you know? You, you, and I know some of you know what I'm talking about. You bombarded my dreams, I couldn't get away. I couldn't pee for three weeks. Because <laughs> I was afraid to go to the bathroom. Psychiatrist, and I said, Why do you want to scare people? And I went to Bernard and said, Don't worry about it, Tony. Anybody that saw this film when they were a kid will remember it forever. So I thank you. I did. You do not follow me when I'm shopping for toilet paper, okay? It's a personal thing. I always talk about, you know, these um, uh, things that we keep from the characters we grew up with. I just had, since I was a little kid, I wondered who owns the original cook from the first film? The original cook, do you have an idea of who has this up? Like the original cook? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing I do own is the original coat. Oh, wow. Well, some mothballs somewhere and you know my kids will get it someday and you know they can do what they want with it. Thank you, Mr. Doc. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Got a little bit of an obscure question for you. Um, years ago you did a show called Halston. Yeah. Uh, Something about being in the shower. I just know that you did a Beastmaster sequel on vacation. Yeah, that was, you know, Adam Green who did Hatchet and Scary Sleepover yeah. and, and Hollison, a brilliant man. Uh, he, he allowed me to be comedic. I am funny, I, I, but because, you know, Hollywood is a weird animal. If you do blue well, they kind of want you to stay blue. You know, they don't want you to be the other colors. But I'm a Skittle inside, so I got many, many colors inside, okay? And um, as a matter of fact, I just, uh, they just offered me, a, I'm not doing it, but they offered me a five episode arc on uh, The Last OG. And I love Tracy Morgan, and I would have done it, but 
I just moved. I don't really feel like going back and forth. So, but I am funny. <laughs> Anybody just talk with me, hung out with me, knows that I love life. Comedy comes to the enjoyment of life. Thank you. Thank you. Rosemary's Baby. Oh, wow. yeah. It's deep, it's mysterious, the Dakota where we lost John Lennon is a spiritual mishap. It's a haunted place, and I think they captured it well. Mia okay. Farrell, she was supposed to be here this weekend, right? She was, yeah. Have you had the opportunity to meet her before? Or yeah. African heavyweight champion in America called Ghost in the House, co written by Ernie Hudson, dear friend of mine. Oh, wow. yeah. So, when I get done, thank God I got 10 movies in the can because I really need to get back on the stage. I can't wait. Is, is there another role that you would like to play that you have had the opportunity? Um, I love Coriolanus, Shakespeare's Coriolanus. Really? Yeah, another failed general that's trying to. Ghosts to sleep, yeah, all those things. It's a lot of plays. I love the Tempest. Oh, I told you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know that when the scene, I felt like they did. She visits uh, your grave there at the Rulli. I found out if you visit your old grave at the at the Rulli Cemetery. No, as one scene when I felt. She visited the, your grave. Oh, I'm kidding. She visited the grave. The grave is kidding. You visited, take a picture of it all, you know. Two years ago, I had, a, I had a health scare that freaked me out, you know, it almost took me out. And uh, I had to go through chemo, and anybody who's ever had any problems with chemo, you know what I'm talking about. It's rough. The nights when you go, what's going on? And, uh, uh, and, and I got the all clear like four months ago. Sometimes we face darkness, we face shadows, we face uncertainty, you know, and, and life is so fragile. Ever since that happened, like, God gave me more work than I ever had in my life, and it, which added up to 10 films, and also an appreciation for life. I, I, I savor food now like never before. My senses are alive. I love meeting you guys, and I love traveling. Appreciate my family more than ever. So anybody who's on the principle of life and death, or sickness, or uh, adversity, just remember that there's an inner being that can like fill you with strength. 
You know, you fight that. And fuck cancer. Fuck cancer. Fuck prejudice. And you know, just be alive in your heart and everything that comes. Yeah. Yeah, there's no shutdown to this shit. You know? <laughs> and I don't tolerate bullshit. I mean, I think, like, um, you know, I, I had the opportunity a couple years ago to do a, a panel with you, and, like, it's always stuck with me. I, I do because I, I think people come, and I'm, you know, the general idea is people come to these panels because they love you as Candyman, they love you as your other work, and I think that everyone here today is going to leave with, like, a whole new attitude and respect for you because you're so incredible. And everything that, that you said today, I, I like, right? Yeah! I love you guys. I just think you're, you're really special and, and the things that you have to say are incredibly heartfelt. I think we can all tell as the audience, no, thank you. Thank you. No, here's the beautiful thing about horror guns. Horror fans are, you know, we have pop culture, but horror fans are a unique family. And you look at what happened this weekend at the Spooky Empire, all you guys who have known each other, you reunite, there's a Nobody, you know, it was joy. Every time I went to the lobby, there's this joy of connection and a shared love of a, a particular genre. So keep that. Keep that alive. So horror, because Hollywood doesn't like horror. Hollywood considers horror to be a bastard subtitle. But Universal Monsters saved Hollywood's ass. You know? <laughs> Bella, Boris, Lon, saved Hollywood, okay? And created monsters that started the love that we all have for this genre. I love horror, I am not ashamed of it, uh, and you guys are the best fans in the world, and I mean that. Woo! I'm conscious art. Sharing all these little snippets with us. Your food always looks amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My daughter made me go on Instagram. I don't know why she did that. <laughs> I don't stop. No? I don't do Snapchat. I don't. <laughs> she did that once. We were at this place, the Huntington Gardens. Was, we like going to museums and just seeing beauty of nature. And she did so I mean, like, this is a dad, I just want you to do it because, you know, I just want you to be a kid again. And it's okay. <laughs> My daughter is a lovely, lovely woman. She's an occupational therapist in New York City. When she went, she was at Wesleyan, and first spring break came up, and I was so nervous because I was a young man once, and I said, oh my God, where's she going to go? Please don't go there, and don't go there. She called me up and said, Dad, I'm going to come visit you, right? First, first spring break. I said, oh my God, I love it. I said, what do you want to do? She wanted to bring her best friend and said, I want to go back to Disneyland. No. Great. Better than Cancun. Better than <laughs> <laughs> and we went to Disneyland. Last ride we went on was a small world after all. Like, this is my world after all. I came out of there. I was bawling like a baby. <laughs> She said, you're embarrassing. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> when, when Alex and Ari were little, I wanted to be, they loved Beauty and the Beast, all the Disney cartoons and stuff, and I tried my best to be one of the characters. It didn't work out. Finally, I got Transformers, which was my first voiceover gig. I called her up and said, Ari, guess what? Guess what? I'm going to be a robot. <laughs> she said, Dad, are you going to grow up? <laughs> Never. Never grow up. Hi. Um, I think that Candida is a really important film, and I think that Jordan Peele is shepherding in a new like era of black horror films. I think the original tried it to subvert the trope of a white savior, and I wanted to know if you thought it was effective in doing that, 
and if you talked about it with the director of the murder rose beforehand? No, we didn't need to discuss that because it was pretty obvious, you know, we're in green and green. I'm a, a, a binging spirit that just, I didn't want to kill people. I just wanted to get the love of my life back, you know, the woman that was taken from me. And I think any man has ever been in love would do that, right? Um, yeah, you know, so many dissertations have been written on the candy man. It's, it's, there are college classes about it. It's like a deep, deep film, guys. And when you saw it when you were eight, it's a different kind of terror that comes in. You know, you don't want to go to the bathroom forever. You know? <laughs> that, that was awesome. <laughs> but then when you look at it again as an adult, you say, wow, there's so many, you know, many, many le levels to it. Uh, it's a love story. There were scenes that were cut out of the original because the studios were nervous that it wouldn't play, you know. Um, and one day those scenes were put back. It's basically when Virginia, uh, where Helen, 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 <laughs> comes to my lair. We're spinning around. It was a special turntable that we built. And uh, Candyman just says a poem to her and she says a poem to me. Yeah, there's many. I think Jordan will, Jordan is going to go hard. You know, the fact that Karini Green no longer exists, gentrification, class structure, he's going to go deep. There may not be one candy man. Perhaps there are a million candy men in existence. People that have been victims, white, black, Spanish, many races that have some sort of redemptive power and some sort of unrequited passion. I'm the grandfather. So, before, before we have to wrap this up, I also just want to say your voice is so incredibly soothing. And I feel like you can like, read these bad news and I take it well. This is what you trust. I wanted to be a psychiatrist at one point. Just talk to me, tell me what you feel. How are you today? Good. There's no problem. Go home now. I feel so much better. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I feel great right now. Um, any, any final thoughts that you want to leave us with here? Um, uh, well, uh, two films I'm really, really proud of. One called All Gone Wrong, which is a true story based on a famous gangster in St. Louis. And he wasn't a typical gangster. He wore sweaters, but he controlled all the drugs, uh, you know, in the Midwest. It's an awesome film. And another film called The Immortal, which is an anthology of uh, what would happen in a couple's existence if one person could not die. Uh, my particular story is done with Robin Bartlett. And we just had a screening at Spirit Fest. I got the best film review that I ever received in my life. They called it a master class in acting. Because it was right around the time of my diagnosis. And I came to it with, uh, you, know, you may not be here in six months, Tony, so you better like pour everything into it. And it's very special, so please check that one out. But once again, I'm fine. I, 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 I'm more alive than I've ever been. And you guys feed that spirit, so thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>